Recording in progress. Moderating the session. So we're handing it over. Wujang, do you want to say anything? Um, no. No. Um, no. Um, just remind people to tune into the tutorial channel. And I don't know, should I introduce Valentina? Um, I guess I forgot to introduce myself yesterday too. Anyway, I am only I am a senior oceanographer at the Five Faces Lab in UW. Uh, just so that you know who I am, because I didn't uh, introduce myself. I wanted to introduce Valentina Steneva. Uh, she's a senior data scientist at the eScience Institute at the University of Washington. Uh, so she's gonna tell us, um, give us a tutorial on overview of machine learning. Um, and I guess, Valentina, please take it over. Uh, hello, everybody. Can everybody hear me fine? Um, I see some thumbs up. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so let me first share my screen. And um, so the plan for this lecture is to basically, I'll just give an overview of machine learning and how it kind of some important concepts and how it has been uh, used in oceanography specifically. Um, and this would be only slides. So there's not really going to be a lot of hands on stuff on Thursday, you will have a little bit more tutorials. And but I'll also share some materials that you can go and do on your own. Uh, just kind of as a, a few words about myself, I am actually, my background is in math and statistics, but I have been working uh, on some um, projects in uh, ocean acoustics uh, for the last several years. And through these experiences, I've also kind of, apart from working on projects, I've been very interested in um, kind of applying machine learning techniques to problems in oceanography, but also teaching other people how to use those techniques in their own projects. So I've been teaching some different versions of machine learning tutorials uh, in Ocean Hack Week over the years. And today you're gonna have the slides version, which um, the disadvantage of that is that I sometimes tend to talk a lot. So I would uh, encourage you to actually uh, ask questions so that you can stop me and we can kind of have some, uh, we can have also some discussions. Uh, so this is the plan for today. Um, basically I'll go through several main things that everybody who's starting to do some machine learning um, projects, they'll have to go through them. So the first thing would be to convert oceanography problems to machine learning problems. Um, and that's, although sounds simple, actually, you know, like you may spend more time here than in some follow-up stage. Uh, distinguish between different types of machine learning problems that can guide you to figure out which methods to use later on. Later on. You'll have to convert your unstructured data sets uh, so that they're ready for machine learning. So we'll discuss this a little bit. Uh, you'll, in the end, you'll have to evaluate your performance. And uh, I'll spend a little bit of time in the end discussing some advantages of deep learning methods and uh, some common architectures. So, so this would be, as I said, this would be like just a kind of a slides presentation. But uh, I have uh, some tutorials, oops, sorry. Uh, anyway, you can see that. So basically there's uh, in the GitHub repo, uh, in the folder with the tutorials, um, I have a link to the slides. So you can find the slides yourself and follow together. And, but I also have some notebooks that are kind of from previous years, we've had some tutorials. And this specific example goes through several uh, different kind of steps of machine learning uh, with an example of uh, well call data. So I encourage you to kind of like go through these on your own and I'll be around over the week so people can ask me questions. And there are many other tutorials, but this is something that I have. So I share this so that uh, you can kind of go through the steps if you want. And I'm happy to answer questions on this tutorial or if you're doing another tutorial. Uh, I'm around and happy to help uh, during the week. So back to, so this is the link and back to kind of like um, uh, the slides. 
And there are a few kind of separate categories of machine learning that uh, uh, are usually good to identify. So first is supervised learning. Uh, and that's usually the idea is that you actually have some training data. And if you think of the uh, analogy with school, you actually have a teacher who is teaching you and providing expert labels, which could be a book. And then you kind of get some, um, you use those labels with the data, uh, you get trained, and in the end you get tested uh, as in school. So this is kind of the idea of supervised learning. Unsupervised learning is more analogical to how uh, children learn. They kind of a little bit look at a few things. They, they kind of find patterns on their own. Nobody's teaching them, but they can learn things on their own. So, um, for example, uh, an example of supervised learning is when uh, in oceanography is when you go and you troll and you actually count what kind of fish you get. So this is kind of like you have some sort of ground truth of what's in the ocean. And you can use that for some further analysis. Uh, an example of unsupervised learning is looking at these patterns, uh, kind of like eddy patterns in the ocean and just discover some interesting patterns about that without really any sort of uh, extra information. And uh, a lot of problems are either in this category or this category or some combination of both. Uh, but there's also reinforcement learning uh, where usually you're driven by some award and you go out and you don't have labels, but you go and explore the environment and figure out things based on the reward. And a good example of this is with uh, robots. Here's some sort of underwater vehicle and they can kind of go explore and figure out something on, on their own. So I'll spend more time, most time like talking about supervised learning and unsupervised learning. I won't talk about reinforcement learning, but it's important to remember that there's all these problems and they're very relevant, uh, especially if you're building some sort of agent exploring the ocean. So I like to start with uh, this um, um, diagram, which was created by Andreas Mueller, who is one of the uh, developers of a famous uh, package in Python, which is called scikit-learn. Uh, so this diagram is trying to solve a problem that's kind of unsolvable. It's basically trying to give you uh, guidance of uh, figuring out which methods to use for your project. Well, I'll start with the reality that, well, it's not that simple. So most probably that's not going to work in all the cases. But it's still giving some good guidance. For example, it starts from like trying to identify uh, whether you have enough data and based on uh, the, maybe you try to figure out if you have some categories for the data. Uh, maybe you figure out if you have labels for the data and based on that, you can decide maybe if you have labeled data, you can go and do some classification. If you don't have labeled data, you go and do some clustering. And uh, you can kind of, you, you can see there's like a lot more details. You look at whether how much the data is, you know, and uh, here and there you kind of get stuck and you get some sort of advice like tough luck and things like that. So, you know, like it's not a simple problem, but on the other hand, it's, this diagram gives like a good overview of some methods that are in this scikit-learn package. And you can kind of navigate through this and try out a few things if you kind of are new to machine learning. So, and that was 2013. So that was quite a long time ago. Uh, so what's the situation now in, um, in um, kind of like in 2022? So as I said, like um, just kind of like the upper category here is the ones that actually have label data. So these are supervised learning and the lower category is unsupervised learning. And as I said, there's some, a lot of efforts recently to actually do some sort of combination of both. So some, that's something to keep in mind, not to be bent to like, I'm here or I'm like here. So people do a lot of combination of, uh, you know, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. But in 2022, some of you may have heard that there has been big advances of uh, using uh, deep learning techniques uh, for um, solving a lot of machine learning problems. So the question is like, you know, is this whole graph 
uh, irrelevant in 2022. And I would argue that it's still quite relevant because a lot of the fundamental methods are still the same. And so that's why I left kind of, this is my own version of the 2022 version. Um, I left uh, basically everything in the middle the same more or less because um, if you have like a problem, most probably you should still first try doing one of these things. Uh, if your problem is not too complicated. But there's, I've added a, a few things that are a little bit uh, uh, relevant in the case uh, when uh, I've added this circle when you have actually spatial or temporal data. So you can see spatial or temporal, spatial or temporal, spatial or temporal. So I think the big difference is if your data is spatial or temporal, then you can actually really benefit from some newer techniques that uh, are usually in like deep learning packages. They are not in the scikit-learn, uh, which is kind of like a like a more classical machine learning package. And um, what kind of methods you can do? And you you can actually have a version of this for a problem that's like classification problem, or you can have a version of this for a regression problem. And I've added some names, but uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more in detail later. We don't have to focus on the names. Um, but yeah, I think that's, in, in the end, my main point is that most of these methods that existed like many years ago are still relevant and one should still try them out and see if they work. And But if they have some sort of correlation in the data, uh, they can actually benefit from some newer techniques. Okay, so I'll go through, um, I'll go through, well, should not have done that. So just kind of defining these problems. And I think a lot of you must probably know what is meant by them, but just so that everybody's on the same page. So regression usually finds relationship between a set of variables and outcomes. And you try to predict uh, the outcomes on new variables. Classification is very similar to regression. It's just the outcomes are categories. And then you try to predict uh, these future categories um, on future data. Clustering is pretty loose. You find groups of objects that are similar to each other. And dimensionality reduction is the idea is you have some data, you don't have any labels, but you converge into this new format that kind of highlights some dominant patterns and also represents the data in a more compact format. It's usually lower dimensional. So you can start with 10,000 variables and you can reduce it to three variables or something like that. So this is kind of loosely what these categories are. And sometimes it's good to try to see if you can fit your problem into one of these categories. So let's see some examples from oceanography so that it's kind of more relevant uh, to what folks are doing. So here's an example of uh, Argo row data. And you can see that there's quite a lot of data, but at the same time, um, there is not coverage of all the, um, basically it's not full spatial coverage. These are still points in the ocean. So a simple question could be, well, if I have uh, all these data for all these points, can I have a map of the full, um, um, maybe some sort of uh, sea surface temperature uh, of the full ocean. And this although may not, in, may not be clear what kind of problem it is, you can set it up as a regression problem because you have data at certain locations and you want to uh, predict what the data is in new locations. And it's kind of like, you can do like a very basic regression, but most probably you will, encounter some problems and here's some reference how uh, in some work that people use actually the spatial temporal structure of these data. So basically they used both space and time information to do a regression. So many times a simple regression may not solve your problem, but you can be a little bit smarter in understanding your problem and you can do uh, better. And in this case, it was solved with Gaussian processes. So there's just a one example of regression, which is um, used in oceanography. So here's one example of classification. 
So I think here there's some data and there's different variables. And there is also some labels to these data. Uh, and the idea is to kind of detect some outliers uh, of these hydrographic profiles. And somebody went through these data and labeled it. And they had a few categories, which is, well, it's good data, it's bad data, missing data, no QC performed, and so on. So, so you can think of those as categories. And in the future, you can try to predict some of these categories when you get new data and basically determine what the bad data is and you can, or probably bad data, and you can find the outliers. So this can be set up as a classification problem. However, as usual, real problems are not as simple as um, problems in a tutorial. So in reality, you realize that these categories are ordered. So, you know, there's some meaning between good data, probably good data, probably bad data and bad data. So there's like just like a gradient across these. Well, these are not ordered. So one needs to think about that. A few that are not ordered and a few that are ordered. And you can claim that the boundaries are very uh, loosely defined. So of course, what is really probably good data versus good data? Uh, you can see that it's not as simple. So, so this was addressed, okay, it wasn't addressed with a simple classification, but it was addressed with uh, this fuzzy logic um, approach. And there's some reference uh, for this work. And there's actually a package called COTD, uh, which is uh, addressing this problem. So again, we realize it's kind of like a classification problem, but we have to do a little bit more to adapt it to the oceanographic problem. Uh, here's one example of identifying clusters in cyanobacterial genus Muria. And I actually don't know much about uh, these uh, species, but the idea was to, to kind of identify clusters in these data and basically have some sort of hierarchical cluster so that you can learn the structure, like, you know, whether this kind of, what is the hierarchical structure of these species? Um, so yeah, that's, that's all I'll say about this. I'm not very expert on these uh, names, uh, but one can read the data and see how it was done. So in a sense, it's a clustering, but here you can also kind of learn about the hierarchy, which is more relevant to science. And here's one example of dimensionality reduction. In this case, this is an example of using principal component analysis or in other people uh, in uh, fluid dynamics, people use the term empirical orthogonal functions. So make sure that you realize that these are similar things. Uh, and in this case, uh, we look at um, uh, some data from El Nino and you try to find the patterns in this data. You don't have any labels, you just look at the patterns. And these are the three most dominant patterns. And the interesting thing is that when you look at time, you can see some sort of oscillation of these patterns. So you kind of can get some time series information in a very compact way once you have identified these patterns. And this is kind of fully unsupervised. So it's a typical example of using dimensionality detection. Okay, so I think by now I should have persuaded everybody, which most probably everybody was already persuaded that in oceanography data comes in all shapes and sizes. And um, I love this picture because it reminds us of all the sensors that can go into the ocean. And you know, when you do a typical machine learning tutorial, they sometimes tell you that your data is ordered like observation one, observation two, and then you have all these features. And once you have this table, you can uh, organize your data this way and you can apply all the functions in the library. It doesn't matter whether it's Python or whether it's, um, uh, it's R. It more or less looks like that. But in reality, as we saw from the X-ray tutorials, the data has a lot of labels, a lot of dimensions, a lot of coordinates, a lot of correlation in, in, in space, in time, and in some other um, factors. So this is something to be very careful when doing machine learning because um, 
in traditional tutorials, they assume that your data observations are independent, which in practice, nothing is really independent. Uh, so one kind of needs to think through that. And this is kind of like just a little diagram of thinking of, let's say now we're trying to do supervised learning, how would the pipeline look like? Well, often one of the first steps is to do some feature extraction. And that feature extraction will uh, help you get your raw data into a format that's ready for machine learning. So maybe in the end, your data will look something like that, but you'll kind of have to do some work to do that. And once you have that, you can have some model, you can have some predictions. You can compare the predictions with your labels. You have to have some quality metric. And based on this metric, you can improve your algorithm. And you can kind of do this again and again. Uh, so these are kind of a few of the main components of a um, supervised learning pipeline. So let's think through like an example of feature engineering. So this is an example of a hydrophone signal. So this is audio and it's raw data. So of course it's not organized maybe as you wish. It's very oscillating. So one of the first steps one would have to do in order to do something with this kind of data is to think through what kind of features they can create so that they can use it in machine learning. So one of the typical cases for such data is to create like a set of features. In this case, they're like spectral features, um, kind of a lot of them are used in music. And you can create a set of variables. And then you're going to have, once you have a list of those, you can have something that looks like this data set. So you have feature one, feature two, feature three, and so on. So this is one approach. Uh, it's been used a lot, many times. And once you have something like that, you can apply some simple methods like logistic regression or decision tree. Uh, these are rather simple methods. Uh, and they just work on a set of variables. Another way to do it is to do a filter on this data and convert it to a power spectrum. So this is kind of like trying to get some spectral information. After that, you can treat it as 1D vector because now this variable, this pattern represents some sort of 1D vector. And, but there is some correlation. While these features may not be that correlated, here there is a very, very close correlation. So in this case, it may be better to use a method called support vector machine, which is good for handling correlated um, uh, variables or something uh, like a, a one-dimensional convolutional neural network, which also looks at correlations. And a third approach would be to just take it as a picture. So you can make a 2D spectrogram and treat it as a 2D array. And then you have several options. You can, uh, because it's two dimensional and it's kind of big, you can apply a dimensionality reduction technique to make it lower dimensional. And then you use one of these methods that are suggested here, or you can treat it as a 2D spectrogram and apply a 2D convolutional neural network, which would take into account uh, the correlations. So the details of these methods don't matter that much. The main point here is that you can have different features and you capture different correlations in your data. Um, and here's like a set of like popular methods that uh, people use. Um, and some of them are rather simple. There are these linear classifiers. And some of them are more complex. So linear classifiers, you have some points in space and the idea is you can just draw a line to separate these points. And usually it's not perfect like in this picture, but more or less you can kind of have some, you can even sometimes transform your data into some other space and then draw a linear line. So uh, here are several cases where you have like linear classifiers uh, logistic regression is one of them. And the good thing is that because it's a regression, you can have very interpretable features and weights associated with them. 
Uh, you can have another method, which is support vector machines. As I said, it's good when data is coming from the same sensor. So when there's some correlation in the variables, but it can be slow. And then there's another method, which is actually very fast and very scalable, uh, but works when your data is counts. So it's called naive base. So there are different methods for different situations, but sometimes you kind of have to compare several of them. On the other hand, uh, if you want to kind of separate these points, you cannot draw a line. Uh, so we need to kind of think smarter. We, we have to draw something like a circle. And for this, you can use nonlinear classifiers. Uh, one of the most simple ones is a decision tree, which basically just makes decision if this is greater than this, do that. If this is less than this, select this category. Uh, and it's very interpretable, but actually it doesn't work that well in practice. So what works better is something called random forest, uh, which combines several trees. Uh, and it's really powerful because works with data, which is categorical or uh, non-categorical. So. Uh, some of these methods here on the left hand side don't work well with categorical data and another method is gradient boosting which is also pretty good pretty similar to random forest so this is kind of like a quick uh, overview like i know it's a lot of terms if you have not seen them you you may have to read more about them but the idea is that i would always suggest if you have a problem to try at least one linear classifier and one nonlinear classifier just so that you have a comparison of both so i'll stop here for a second maybe to see if people have some questions on this kind of uh, just kind of the general path of um getting started with machine learning are there any questions we haven't seen uh any so far in the channel uh someone might be typing um okay someone just asked a very basic question what is ground truth um that's a good question like i'll look at this i like this example because i thought through this a little bit so we have the fish here and i think this is some cartoon and that is it is you can say well this is ground truth but the truth is uh there's some study how they they learn how the fish is of size bigger than i don't know five centimeter and the truth is that that's what they they learned but the truth is that all the fish that was less than five centimeter it fell through the fell through the net so it's an example of how your ground truth can be wrong right um so you always have something wrong um i mean there's never going to be perfect ground truth but depending on the problem, you'll have to work with what you have. So in this case, you at least you acknowledge that you're not going to learn anything about fish that is uh, smaller than five centimeters. So I think it's OK not to have perfect ground truth, but it's important to acknowledge what's missing in your labels, you know. There's always issues with labels. Uh, we're human, we make mistakes. We don't know what, I mean, sometimes we don't know what we want to. We want to learn something about the ocean. So we don't really, if we had all the answers, maybe um, we don't have to do research, but we have a lot of open questions, but there's some knowledge that we already have. So we just decide how to use that. So is that kind of helping with the question? I think the important thing is to understand uh, the limitations of the ground truth. And there is a separate question is, do you recommend pre-processing your data like detrending or standardizing? Um, it kind of depends. Uh, I have like, a, like, I think I have like a, maybe one of my next slides will dive into this that uh, in the past, people did a lot of pre-processing, uh, but these days, uh, some methods can handle a little bit more raw data. So I think it's good to try to um, to kind of like to keep your data as raw as possible. 
uh, but you also should understand the assumptions of the method and some methods have this requirement that you need to standardize your data. So it a little bit de depends from methods to methods. Uh, I think it's important to understand why you're doing this pre-processing uh, as opposed to follow a tutorial. Like we always do that. I think that can lead to many mistakes. Uh, I think if you're doing some detrending, you really need to understand what trend you are removing. If you're kind of uh, equalizing, you know, like making the variance to be one, you know, because, you know, maybe that, that that's already a, you know, you're going to lose important information if you do that. So, so yeah, I, I would say that do that, but like understand why you're doing it. Um, and some methods, they always recommend it, but understand what you're losing by doing it. Um, so, for example, in this case, uh, where is it? Sorry, like uh, this, um, this example, uh, you can actually do some filtering, right? Uh, maybe you can clean a little bit outliers and maybe it can help. Uh, but maybe maybe like random forest is a method that maybe it can handle it without the outliers. Of course, if there are really crazy outliers, you may need that. And that's why people have these QC techniques. Um, but if you could get by with less pre-processing, it's even better unless you really know what needs to be processed. Um, so yeah, I think I have a lot of no kind of like the answer is a little bit depends on the scenario. Um, yeah, but some methods uh, have assumptions, so it's good to read what these assumptions are. Um, okay, so uh, uh, any other example, questions? Uh, not at the moment, but a small uh, time check. Uh, we are in theory sort of 13 minutes to 2 p.m. Pacific time, but we're sure that many people want to hear about this entire thing. So one thought is that we can, you know, uh, maybe take a small break at the end of the hour. And then for those of you who want to continue to tune in on this tutorial, we can keep going for like maybe half an hour, but we will definitely record that part for anyone who cannot continue. Uh, what do you think, Valentina? Uh, I'm fine with that. And I have no idea how 30 minutes just passed by. So sorry for that. <laughs> oh, no worries. Um, I actually mm -hmm. noticed that maybe just 15 minutes ago. So, all right. So, uh, should I let you know at two? Uh, yeah. Um, okay. okay. I can then go through a few things a little bit quicker too, uh, so that people at least know what to look at when they start their project. But uh, I think a few of the next um, kind of like, um kind of discussions is a little bit deciding you know kind of understanding the performance and uh you know the types of method that you select um so um so the question would be like well should i do then this method which is i think that's kind of relates a little bit to the pre-processing too you know like should i select a few features and just work with them and then i fully understand them or should I should I keep the data as is? And sorry, as I said, uh, uh, could you uh, go back to the slideshow mode? Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. So so yeah, basically this kind of relevant to the question and um, there is that we kind of talked about and you can kind of leave your data as is, but usually it's larger and then you need to have uh, some methods which can handle more complex relationships. So. Uh, so there's this notion of model complexity. So like a linear regression is a very simple model, but you can have some sort of complex nonlinear regression neural network that is a very complex model with many, many parameters. And the you can say that there is no free lunch because there is this notion of bias variance trade-off. And the idea is that if you if you have like a very uh, simple model, you'll be very biased because you, your model is very limited. Um, and if you have a very complex model, uh, you will be less biased, but you can 
you can have more variance in the sense that you can start overfitting on your uh, data because your model is too flexible. So in the end, there's kind of like golden middle between these, you know, like very simple models versus very complex models uh, where your prediction error uh, would be as low as possible. And because the prediction error is a combination of the variance and bias. So you can have less variance uh, and more bias or, or kind of the other way around. So kind of the goal is to be somewhere here and the process kind of, on this left-hand side is usually what's called underfitting. So your model is too limited. And on this side, you start to overfit uh, to your data. So that's something to keep in mind. And in order to avoid all this stuff, you actually have to do a lot of work to really understand what your performance is on, um, on some testing data. And the rule is that you need to kind of put away some data set for testing. Uh, and you want you, you should not use these data set for model selection and parameter tuning. And the rule is actually to use it only once, which I know many people never do that. Uh, but in a sense, this should be your final evaluation. But you can have what's called, um, so the test set, you just leave it out, but you can have what's called validation set, which is part of your training set. And you can um, use that many times. So the idea is to kind of split these test set and validation set. And the validation you can use as much as you want. Uh, but in the end, you're going to evaluate your performance on this new untouched uh, testing set. So this is kind of important to really to avoid actually overfitting. And you can say that, well, if you just have one validation set, maybe your problem would be biased towards this validation set. So why not have several ones? And the way this is done with something called k-fault cross-validation. So the idea is that this is your test data. You leave it out. This is your training data. You can split your training data multiple times, and you can call one fault to be the validation one, and the other ones are called the training ones. And then you can alternate on each split. So this way you have one, two, three, four, five different validation sets each time you do this experiment. And uh, it's kind of nice because you're not biased toward one, you can see the performance better. Of course, it's more expensive to do that, uh, but it's a good strategy. And the nice thing is because you have five of them, in the end, you can average the performance over all of them. So that's good because you're not biased to this one, but you also get a variance estimate because you have five of them. So you have mean and variance. So you get really a sense of your, the performance of your, of your algorithm, not just as a point estimate, but also as a statistical estimate. So there's a, in practice though, you have to do more, not just that. And the reason is that many times the samples have very tilted distributions. So you may want to get some samples which preserve like the label distribution of uh, your um, kind of of your data. So you have to stratify it based on the labels. Uh, you can sometimes balance the samples because if they are too tilted, you may have bad performance. Uh, sometimes there's groups. For example, you have cruise, cruise data from different cruises. You may want to do group cross-validation where you make sure that you predict on a new cruise every time so that you're not biased to your cruise data. Uh, you also, if you're considering time series, you may want always to predict like on the future or so that you train on the past and predict on the future or kind of do some other versions. And here I have a link for all of you to, to kind of, it's from scikit-learn, um, to kind of look even... You know, even if you use R, I think the link is good to make you think of all the ways you can split your data. And now kind of getting back to like, well, we're at the final stage and we kind of want to evaluate the performance. And I think here it's one of the hardest parts. Like I think you can figure out the methods, but figure out what the outcome is, it's not as simple. So let's say that somebody says the algorithm achieved an accuracy of 99%. That sounds very good, but you should always ask more questions 
than just kind of reading this and taking it as this. So you can ask, well, if it's 90, it's accuracy of 99%, on which set was this accuracy? Was it the training? Was it the validation? Uh, did, you, did you split them properly? Did you use that set for parameter selection? Because if they used it, then this means this is the validation set. This is not the test set. You can ask other questions. What, what are your baselines? What accuracy will you achieve if you only predict no and yes? So you may actually get better performance if you just do something stupid and say no all the time. Uh, so that can be a misleading number. Uh, what if you randomly guess? So you need to have some baselines. Can you tune your detection threshold to select only detections with very high comfort, confidence? Most probably you need to do some more work here because um, there is, you know, one can kind of decide uh, whether they want to um, kind of assume the, the detections with low confidence are true. And then what else? what else? Can you ensure you retrieve mox objects even if some detections are wrong? You can remove the one, wrong ones manually after that. So this is like a, an example when we have, um, it's kind of in the tutorial and you have, uh, you have like uh, that the task is to find a uh, right well up calls. And the truth is there are very few of those in the data set. So it's very easy to say no always. And in that case, you're gonna get pretty good performance if you just say there is no right up call. But that's not the point of the scientific problem. You must probably want to retrieve all these up calls. And even if you get some of them wrong, uh, you can correct them manually, right? You don't wanna lose uh, these observations. And this is one way to kind of address some of these questions by looking at what's called the confusion metrics. So this is works well for um, classification problems because you can have all the categories and look at all possible mistakes you can make. So accuracy only addresses this diagonal, but there's all these other situations where you predict that it's not right away call, but turn out it was right up call. <laughs> Uh, so basically you predict no, but it's true. And then here is the other case that's interesting. You predict true, uh, but it's no. So this one is doing well, but you can see this one is not doing well at all. So basically you'll have to do some tuning uh, in order to improve this box. And uh, you can do this by tune uh, a threshold, which kind of uh, de decides whether you should be more conservative calling things an up call or less conservative. Um, a few notions that are important. So as I said, accuracy is only the diagonal, but precision is important. That is correctly predicted calls from the total number of calls, true calls. And recall is the correctly predicted calls from the predicted calls. So you can tune those depending on your application. And I have a few examples of how one can tune this in an actual classification problem. So most of the algorithms are actually um, have some, before they get to the predictions, they have something called a score, uh, which is usually a variable that's from minus infinity to plus infinity. And that's kind of a little bit trying to basically say that maybe if it's positive, it's more chance that it's uh, this class or if it's negative, it's not this class. And this variable is transformed in the context of probabilistic models. This is actually some sort of confidence score, but not all models are probabilistic. So kind of just keep, keep it as a score, just some value. And that gets converted to something that's close to um, zero and one through the sigmoid function. And then if you take a simple threshold at, at uh, zero, you'll basically get that above 0.5, uh, you'll get, uh, you'll call it uh, a true and below 0.5, probability of 0.5, you're gonna call it false. So it's kind of a way to convert your scores to some sort of measures of um, kind of between zero and one, which kind of looks like probability, but not always 
because not all models are probabilistic. So in the context of the distribution of these values, you can see that you can have some picture like that. And basically you have to decide where you put your threshold. And you see that if you put it too much on the right, you're gonna call everything false. If you put it too much on the left, you're gonna call everything true. So you need to kind of tune it so that it's optimal. And in practice, you're gonna always have some error because you cannot split those two um, distributions. So that's why it's important to kind of tune this threshold and the red dot basically goes through different values of the threshold. And this is something called ROC curve, which stays for receiver operating characteristic curve. And it's good to look at it because it gives you the different types of errors you can get. And the idea is that you're gonna pick the one that's close to this left top corner. You wanna pick that one. Um, so it's a one way to tune a threshold. And here's a few other visualizations, which are from this um, GitHub repo, which is great because somebody built them up. Um, uh, also, when you have, as I said, when you have unbalanced data sets, then you can see that the, the, this curve doesn't change much. So it's not really a good measure. So then one needs to go with, look at the precision and recall curve and then can really understand the performance. So I encourage you to kind of look through those and think through your problems. Um, um, so Valentina, do you think this might be a good point? To yeah, that, that's what I'm thinking. Awesome. Uh, yeah, we can kind of, this kind of a lot of evaluation details and we can kind of stop here. And if anybody wants to join later, I'm happy to continue talking. And if not, uh, you can start diving in projects and I can still help out uh, with, um, actual questions in machine learning. And uh, awesome. So Valentina, take it over when you're ready. All right, can people hear me? I actually don't see anybody, but I assume people can hear me. Um, okay, so I'll try to be quick, just to kind of go through a few, basically I'll talk a little bit just about deep learning and how that relates to the previous uh, points I said. Before that, um, kind of on the, the main lesson is we have to spend a lot of time on evaluation. And this reference I kind of want to share is, um, it's kind of people talk about the machine learning reproducibility and whether you can kind of, you know, when you kind of train some models, whether you can really like, you know, whether this is reliable and can be reproduced. And there are some recent study in which they kind of looked for some papers and tried to identify some issues with the evaluation or like their strategy and so on. So it's kind of interesting to look at, not so much to blame these people because I wouldn't blame them because it's not a simple problem, but it's more to look at what can be improved and you know like read what kind of issues they have identified and basically learn for ourselves and improve it in our projects and you can see there are just things simple things like not test set uh but there are some duplicates there's this notion of leakage where your test set see some see something from the train set and so on so i encourage you kind of looking through that and to help a little bit with these kind of issues, uh, people have started building a lot of these kind of frameworks in which you can do, you can track your machine learning experiments. So that's also something that you could explore. Um, there is kind of an explosion of these tools and companies, and some of them are open source and some of them are not. Uh, they basically try to facilitate your workflow. And it's something people call now MLOps, which says for machine learning operations. Um, and I do think it's kind of like, it's not just like, oh, this is just the final popular thing, but it's actually very important because you can version your models, you can version your label data sets, you can, you can monitor your performance over long periods of time and things like that and deploy your model. So it's actually quite, uh, useful things, um, uh, to, to kind of, to 
to learn how to track your experiments. Otherwise, you just do many experiments and in the end you forget uh, which one provided which result. So now, like, what about deep learning and kind of where does it fit within these other uh, simpler methods I mentioned? Well, I think uh, deep learning has been there for many, many, many years, uh, still from the 50s, actually. Uh, but there has been like, you know, like increase in their use, uh, partially through improvement of training data sets, through improvement of libraries to actually do machine learning. Uh, with with neural networks and also I think the types of problems that we can address they're just like a lot more uh, spatial temporal data that is kind of being fed so that's why uh, that's where they kind of become handy so these are just some older plots I'm not sure what's happening right now uh, but there can be very useful and but then sometimes one needs to be careful about them so what is really uh, deep learning? Well, I think uh, we can start with what is a neural network. And the simplest example is uh, if you think of what is logistic regression, basically it just has a weight multiplied by a variable, another weight multiplied by another variable. So basically this is just linear combination of variables. And then you have some transformation of this linear combination and you get your output. And this is usually some small nonlinear function like the sigmoid function we looked at earlier. So that is already a neural network, very simple one. So I think if you wanna learn more, start from logistic regression because it's, it's a very, very kind of like example that we can understand. So that's kind of usually what people call like shallow networks because it's just like one layer. You can have like one or two layers. Um, this is an example where you have more layers, but it's the same idea. You have a linear combination of variables and weights, and you have some nonlinear transformation, and then you go to the next level. So that is really what this is called fully connected neural network because all the nodes are connected. So you can basically, you can think of it as nested regressions. And yeah, these are neural networks and you can, if you have many, many layers, it becomes a deep neural network. And you can quickly see that if you wanna calculate how many variables these network have, um, well, usually it's the number of layers, the number of nodes here times the number of nodes here, plus some extra um, kind of number of nodes in the, the second layer, because this is kind of like a bias term. So this, but kind of the order is number of these times number of these. So you can see that it can start growing very quickly for like an image. Like for example, if I have an image, um, there's gonna be very many, many, many nodes. So it's gonna explode pretty quickly. So in practice, I would argue that fully connected networks are not that, that practical. Um, and in fact, usually people don't use this simple structure uh, in practical problems because they just grow very quickly and become very large. So then why are neural networks useful? Um, the reason is, one of the reasons is that they have this notion of you can build neural network architectures where the weights are being shared and that kind of avoids this problem of um, basically having a node between, having a weight between every two nodes. and so this is good for reducing the number of parameters, but it's also good for exploring the correlation structure because by deciding which weights would be shared, you actually make assumption that those weights would be the same. So there's gonna be the same pattern over a certain range of um, observations. And that's very natural with spatial and temporal data. So that's kind of where neural networks come in because they, they explore this structure and that's why they're useful for these kind of problems. Um, so convolutional neural networks explore kind of local structure. Um, and basically they, they look at kind of like um, some sort of, basically they apply a filter to like a image and they can kind of assume that um, the weights would be shared and that helps with uh, finding patterns like spatial patterns uh, in the 
in the image. And those filters actually turn out to be related to traditional image processing techniques. So in the end, the learned filters are actually something that people have used earlier without learning them. So in a sense, they do find something meaningful. And on the other hand, for temporal and for convolutional neural networks, you, you can use them for 1D, 2D, 3D, whatever you want. Uh, so it's kind of like a little bit local. It's not gonna work with very big time, kind of like spatial ranges. So good for grid data, which there's a lot of it in oceanography. Uh, the other kind of scenario is when you have a lot of temporal correlation structure. So if you have like very short kind of like signals, you can still use 1D neural network for that because it's gonna find some uh, 1D temporal local patterns. But if you have like long time series and you want to study long and short range relationships, Okay, uh, then you must probably want to use a more complex model and kind of you can look at recurrent neural networks and uh, LSTM, uh, which stands for long short term memory and like a technique that's quite popular, uh, which is called transformers. So all of these are fancy names, but the main idea that they explore the temporal structure and if you you can kind of draw it this way that basically there's this pattern going kind of recurring pattern, but you can also unfold them and really see what kind of look at it as time series model and see what the relationship between ST and ST minus one is. Uh, and you can do this with simple time series models that are not deep learning. But if you wanna look at many long relationship, most probably it's gonna be easier to learn them with um, a deep learning technique. So these are kind of, I think, two main categories that can be useful. And uh, some examples from kind of from oceanography is, well, first of all, um, it's kind of like when, when um, these neural networks are learning features, the interesting thing is that they learn a hierarchy of features. And the first layers kind of just have some sort of edge patterns. So in this case, you have this flower and you're gonna learn something about the edges of the, of the flower. But it's interesting that later they start to, to learn things that are, okay, this is the flower. Uh, this, is, this is kind of the, this, learn something about the petals of the flower and so on. So basically there's this hierarchy that helps really detect the object as opposed to just using like a basic technique which just detects the edges. And that's, that's kind of what has made them useful because they do discover something meaningful. And some examples in oceanography. So there's a paper on phytoplankton classification. You can see that they're pretty like complex patterns here and it, you can work to, de to detect the different phytoplankton categories. There is the whale detection case for which you have a tutorial. And here's an example of finding patterns of kind of distinguishing patterns of different waves, uh, whether it's uh, plunging, spilling, or unbroken wave. So just some examples to look to look through. And these are all examples like 2D um, convolutional neural networks. So the initial success of deep learning relied on building big training data sets, as I say, not so much more on like the architecture. Um, but once a lot of data sets existed, people realized that they could use um, model train on one data set to apply it to a different data set. And these model train on one data set um, can be still useful for another data set. For example, there's like famous ImageNet data set, which has just images from the internet. And people have used those models to train um, models for um, problems in, in science. And the reason is that, as I said, the features, the low case, the lower features are relevant. They're kind of local features, so they could be useful across domains. And that's kind of the notion of transfer learning, where you don't have a lot of data for your problem, you can use a model trained on another similar problem 
and just retrain it a little bit um, and kind of fine tune it to your problem. And here's an example of fish image classification. Uh, but there's a lot of examples that, um, that um, exist. So that's something to keep in mind. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You kind of have to have to try things out. One other reason that um, these very complex model work uh, is kind of that, well, first, if we think of the previous example that we talked about bias variance trade off, basically they tell us if the, so in this case, capacity means complexity. So this is just a picture from a paper. So they told us that if the model is too complex, we're going to start at some point uh, overfitting on your on our training data and the result on the test data would be very bad. That's kind of like bias variance trade-off. We know that. So then why on earth would we use these models here, which have like millions and millions of parameters? I mean, these are really complex models. Why would they work? Um, you know, like even with the weight sharing, there's still many, many, many parameters. So one thing that's interesting that was discovered uh, is this notion of, so this, this is kind of what they teach us in, in class. Uh, you know, like at some point, this curve starts to, the air starts to go up. So you shouldn't have that complex model. So what they call the double descent curve is uh, basically the, the notion that at some point you reach this threshold, it goes up and then starts going down again. And they call this, you enter this interpolating regime. So basically your model is over-parameterized, but it actually starts learning every possible example that you can, you can have from this type of data set. So it's pretty interesting because it's kind of not really expected that it's gonna start going down again. And that's what people have observed with uh, deep neural networks that after some point, actually the performance starts to improve again and again. So that's why these very, very deep models actually are helpful. Uh, at some point, they actually kind of, you know, like uh, their power kicks in. And of course, it's very tricky because you don't know where exactly this is and you may be just overfitting. So you have to be very careful to get to this point. And of course, it depends also having training, enough training data, but it's just like an interesting phenomenon. And this is a recent paper um, in PNNS that discusses this. And it turns out that this is not only true for deep neural networks, it's actually true also for very deep uh, random forest models, so models with a lot of parameters. So even some of the traditional models can exhibit this uh, effect. So that kind of explains why on earth these models are working. Um, any questions on this kind of model evaluation for complex models or uh, more generally on deep learning. Um, we don't see any specific questions at the moment. Okay, so I think I'll just go through a few examples that are not exactly traditional machine learning problems that can be solved with deep learning. And I'll just kind of point through the names. I'm not gonna talk much about them but it's good to know when you have problems. So these are more like computer vision problems. Um, so there's two sets of problems that are very popular. One of them is called object detection. And in this case, you have some sort of an object that you can enclose in more or less some sort of box <laughs> and you try to detect these objects. And usually your data, if you have some training data, it should be in this format that it is sort of self-contained and you have a box. It doesn't need to be a box, it could be like a boundary. Uh, and you can detect these objects and the rest is background. That's kind of the idea. And there's this other problem, which is called semantic segmentation. The difference is that in this case, you wanna put a label on every pixel. So you don't really necessarily have to have a box, but you usually have some sort of mask that represents uh, the labels of this, um, Object in this case, the label is the same for all the all these patterns, but you can actually have different labels. Like each one could be a separate category. 
So this is kind of problems that come up a lot and computer vision folks tend to use a lot of acronyms. So don't worry about them. I just list them here. There's a lot of acronyms. But once you identify that you need to do this or that, you can find the corresponding um, methods to do that. And a few of them are here are famous ones I've listed. And they all deal with boxes and masks are CNN is kind of one step further because once you have the box, you can do like the boundary, which is kind of useful. And the unit type of problems can handle semantic segmentation. And there's a lot of variations here too. There is one more task that's kind of can be handled with uh, uh, deep learning, which is kind of different task. Uh, it's kind of trying to do multi-resolution where your data is not uh, very high resolution. Then you can do like a very different approach where you have these generative uh, adversarial neural nets. So they're like generative models that generate new data. And they're very handy when you try to really kind of fill in the missing data. So that's something to keep in mind. And that's pretty different from the other types of problems. Uh, people have done some amazing examples of filling missing data uh, with um, generative adversarial neural networks. So this took something to keep in mind. And the other example that shows up a lot in oceanography too is when you can say, well, I don't even have data. I just simulate models. And uh, neural networks have been used a lot for speeding up solutions of uh, differential equations, because in the end, there are just some sort of a kind of interpolation scheme. So uh, there are some examples where you can, once you have inputs and outputs of the very expensive differential equ equation, the solver may take forever to, to, to do the right solution. You can actually learn that fitting function with neural networks. Of course, it's a little bit risky because you want to make sure it preserves the physical properties of your um, equations. But some example where they achieved 12,000% acceleration for forecasting ocean waves. Um, yeah, and I think, okay, so regarding, you know, all these different methods, as we said, these are the more complex ones. These are the less complex ones, usually more complex one can achieve better accuracy, but in practice, you have to compare it. I'm not going to tell you that this is always the case. Uh, and it's kind of like you can select also which one to use based on whether you want to interpret what's happening. And these different methods have different ways of trying to interpret them. So like, for example, in regression, you... You, it's very simple. You have coefficients for each variable and you can say if I increase these coefficients, the effect would be stronger. Uh, similar, similar with Lasso regression, but you limit only a few positive coefficients. So it's even more interpretable. Decision trees uh, have this notion of when do you split on important variables? So that's also useful to tell us where, where the model is looking at. Uh, random forest has this notion of variable importance, which kind of comes from this individual decision tree splittings. Hierarchical clustering methods have dendrogram structure. Uh, PCA methods, you can do something called a biplot to kind of explain what the variables mean. And neural networks, although sometimes they are judged as non-interpretable, sometimes they, they have um, you can look at the individual layer, layers and understand really what they're doing. So each method has their own way. You just kind of have to read more about them. I have uh, kind of like a final topic, which is just kind of uh, saying a few words about dimensionality reduction techniques, given that I spend most time on supervised classification. But just to keep in mind that um, again, as with classification, you can have linear methods and you can have nonlinear methods. And I would encourage you, if you have a problem, try one linear one and one nonlinear one at least, just so that you get a sense of what's going on. And linear decompositions usually transform your data as some sort of uh, matrices, 
and you can really interpret what these weights mean and what these uh, components mean. Uh, there's a few techniques here. Uh, you can get them if you use Python, you can get them from the decom decomposition module, but they're in every library in Python R. You can find those methods. Um, and um, you can use them for feature extraction, visualization, compression. Uh, they're very powerful. Like I would always do at least one of these. Uh, on the other hand, uh, nonlinear embeddings can kind of discover structure that cannot be discovered with linear methods. And they usually are kind of trying to uh, preserve some sort of distances in the data. And that's kind of what their driving factor is. But sometimes they do preserve not the exact distances, like multidimensional scaling is preserving some sort of distances. Um, but some of these other methods are trying to preserve like some sort of spectral structure or some sort of um, uh, distribution structure. So they have their all variations. And with these, the problem is that they are very flexible. So at some point you can always find some patterns. So that's something to be careful about that these are, these are more conservative these can find patterns that may not be there. So like you start fooling yourself with the patterns. But um, here's one example that kind of looks actually uh, meaningful. So this is the whale call spectrograms. Some of them have whale call, some of them don't. And you can see with the PCA projection, the yellow and purple points are kind of I mean, you can see that there are similar spectrogram patterns next to each other. So that's good. Like all these have line, vertical lines here on this right hand side. And these, ha like these have horizontal lines on the other hand. And here we have some whale calls, like this pattern is a whale call. So they kind of seem to, to be grouped, like they get grouped by a similarity, but they're not, you, don't, you cannot just draw one line and separate them. On the other hand, with this nonlinear method, which is called TSNI, you see that the purple points got more separated from the yellow points. So like it kind of like pulled the data set apart and, um, and the yellow points have well calls and the purple points don't have yellow calls. Um, so in a sense, you see the power of a nonlinear mapping that it can push things further apart. Uh, but at the same time, there are some examples where they've shown that uh, TSNI can find patterns that are not really uh, realistic. So one should be kind of a little bit careful. So I'll stop here. I have some resources just added for, for different, I think I'm a little bit biased here to Python, although some tools are not language specific, but I think you can find the corresponding uh, R packages. For example, PyCaret is a Python package, but it was built based on the caret. R package, which is amazing. So um, you can find the right tools for your language. And I have shared a few references, uh, some very famous books. Um, I think this um, summer school is interesting because they focus a little bit more on trustworthy uh, predictions, which is relevant for those dealing with weather and policy and so on. So that might be some something interesting to oceanographers working. Um, at the intersection of policy and people. And a few examples of semi-supervised learning and human in the loop machine learning, which I didn't talk about, but in practice, you may be, you may need to do something like that because the problems are not that simple. So I'll stop here and I'll see if there's any questions. Um, let's see. Right now, um, we have one question. I think uh, Liz asked the question before you started the second session, though. Um, I guess it's more specific to the whale call. So I guess, do you want to take it here or do we do you want to do it offline? Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the question is. <laughs> Uh, oh, uh, it's it's uh, something related to background noise and spectral. Oh, background. okay. So maybe that I can answer in the chat because they may not be in the session uh, anymore. So I could okay. maybe follow up. In it's in the in the Slack, right? So I could yes. follow up with that. Um, okay. Yeah, I think I can do that later. 
Cool. Yeah, and Liz also said that she was checking with you also. Okay, that's great. Okay, thank you, Valentina. This yeah, great. Thank, thanks and sorry for making it a double tutorial as opposed to a single <laughs> tutorial. Not at all. We enjoy it. Um, let's see. Uh, 